Hello, Gophers. It is my pleasure to present at this very first virtual GopherCon. We made some great progress on generics this year. If we are going to adopt generics, it will be the single biggest change to the language. So it's really important that we're all on board and that you get it right. My goal with this presentation is to get everybody up to date with our latest thinking, whether you followed along with our design so far or not. I also want to be clear up front that this is all joint work with Ian Lance Taylor. Some of you may recognize him by his GitHub picture on the right. Ian has been investigating various ideas for generics for Go on and off for probably about a decade. I joined this effort only in earnest around 2018. Our design was also directly influenced by Phil Wadler and his distributed research team with their work on Featherweight Go. The aim of that project is to investigate the type theoretical aspects of extending Go with generic features. It helped steer us towards the current interface-based approach and gave us confidence that our design is theoretically sound. And last but not least, a big thanks to every gopher who provided feedback via mailing lists, proposal issues, and experience reports over the years, with a special shout out to about a dozen gophers who gave us very detailed comments on earlier versions of our latest design draft. So earlier this year, in June, we published our latest draft design. The most significant change from last year is that we abandoned contracts in favor of interfaces. It turned out that contracts um, are essentially a form of syntactic sugar for a set of interfaces, so it seemed to uh, make sense to proceed with the more elementary uh, construct interfaces. This change also answered a lot of open questions. It simplified the design and also made it 100% backward compatible, as there is now no need for a new keyword anymore. We call this new design type parameters draft design because of the primary new feature over existing Go. Type parameters also have a sort of a meta type, which we call constraints. And finally, type inference is used to simplify generic function calls. Type inference is helpful, but it's not needed for genericity. The takeaway is this. If you understand type parameters and constraints, you will understand how to write generic code in Go. For the rest of this talk, I may sometimes use the term generics to refer to these new features. So first, let's have a look at ordinary parameter lists. It is a list of parameter names, representing variables inside a function with corresponding parameter types. The types specify what values are accepted as concrete arguments. This is all basic Go stuff. Now, a type parameter list looks exactly like an ordinary parameter list except that it uses square brackets as delimiters. At least syntactically, there's no learning curve here. But now, the parameter names stand for types rather than variables, and in the position of types, we have meta types, and we call those constraints. Like the types in ordinary parameter lists specify what ordinary non-type arguments are permitted, the constraints specify what type arguments are permitted. And as a convention, and to visually highlight that we're dealing with types, we capitalize type parameter names. So why do we want generics for Go? This has been motivated many, many times, but I think it's useful to look at a concrete example uh, as a motivation. In Go, the basic and most general sort API looks like this. This is, in fact, one of the very first if perhaps the first quasi-generic API that made it into the standard library. We've been using it ever since. It works, works pretty well, but it's somewhat tedious to use. There have been various improvements over the years, and helper functions have been added over time to make it more convenient. But at the very bottom, this is what we have. So let's be honest. What we really want is something closer to this API. At the very end of the day, we just want to call sort with our slice as an argument and have everything else taken care of, type safe, efficient, and all. So how do we get there? So rather than having a fixed element type, we need to tell our sort function that the element type itself is provided by the caller as an additional argument. So we do this by declaring elem as a type parameter for sort through a type parameter list. We can now use the type parameter elem like any other type in this function. 
but there is something missing. The sort function eventually will need to compare elements. It can't do that without knowing anything about them. We also don't want to get an error inside sort when we call it and it turns out that the actual slice elements don't uh, have any method to compare them against each other. So this is where constraints are coming in. A constraint specifies the requirements that a type, must spe a type parameter must specify. Constraints in generics are simply, uh, sorry, constraints in generic Go are simply interfaces. Because a type argument must satisfy its constraint to be valid, and because constraints are interfaces, we have a very simple rule. A type argument is valid if it implements its constraint. And again, we know what implementing an interface means, which makes this straightforward. With this, we can now complete our generic sort signature. We simply provide an interface with a less method as a constraint. What we are saying here is this. Sort is a generic function that can operate on slices of any element type, as long as that element type specifies, that is, implements the given constraint, or in our case, as long as it implements a less method. So keep in mind that even though the constraint is an interface, the actual type argument does not need to be an interface. In fact, it almost never will be. There is something else interesting going on here. The argument of less refers to the type parameter lm. We'll see later what that means and why it is important, but it does tell us something about the scope of type parameters. The scope of an ordinary parameter that is, the range in the source code where it is accessible is only the function body. In contrast, the scope of a type parameter starts with the opening square bracket rather than the opening curly brace of the body, and it ends with the end of the function body. That means that the type parameter is visible within the entire function. This allows us to use a type parameter in all parameter lists, for instance here as an argument type for the list method, and also in the result. So back to our original quest. With our new definition of sort, we can now use it to sort the contents of a bookshelf. Our bookshelf is simply a slice of books. My book has a less method, which allows us to compare one book against another by some no further specified criteria. And we can now invoke sort. Since we have a type and an ordinary parameter list, we need to provide arguments for both. The type argument is book, and the regular argument is bookshelf. And with that, we've got a generic function call. But how does this actually work? So let's analyze this sort call in detail. There are two steps, one for passing the type argument and one for passing the ordinary argument. Passing the type argument is called instantiation. It transforms the generic sort into a specific sort just for books. Note that this step happens at compile time. So how does the compiler go about this? First, it substitutes the type argument for its type parameter in the entire function signature. Here, the type parameter lm is replaced by book everywhere in the signature. Then the compiler checks that book in fact satisfies the respective constraint. Uh, that, that means it, it must implement that constraint interface. It is absolutely crucial to compare against the rewritten less method, which is expecting a book argument. And as expected, it does, and so it's all good. If it didn't, we would get a compile time error. As a result of this instantiation step, the compiler creates a new virtual function, sorry, new internal function, here marked with a hash. This new function is not generic anymore, and its ordinary argument is a slice, sorry, its ordinary parameter is just a slice of books. Now, once we have that instantiation, instantiated and now ordinary function, the rest of the, fun of the function is of the function call is type checked as usual. The compiler simply needs to verify that bookshelf can be assigned to a slice of books, which, as expected, it can. And with this, the compiler can proceed with generating code for the function invocation. To summarize, type checking a generic function call consists of type checking its instantiation followed by type checking its invocation. So type checking and instantiation is always done in two steps. First, all type parameters are replaced with their type arguments in the entire signature. And after that, it is checked that each type 
argument satisfies its constraint. And this substitution step is absolutely central to instantiation. If the function was success successfully instantiated, the compiler checks the function invocation as usual. So in Go, we like to keep distinct operations separate, that is, orthogonal if we can, because that allows us to combine operations in new and interesting ways. And since passing a type argument and passing a regular argument are distinct operations, we can split them apart as well. For instance, in this case, we can just instantiate the generic sort to obtain a new function, book sort. This function is not generic anymore, has the desired signature, and can be used directly to sort as many bookshelves as we want. But it is not just functions that can be generic, types can be generic as well. And the mechanism is exactly the same. A type parameter list is used to parameterize the type. And because this works for any type, it also works for interfaces. For instance, we can factor out, if you will, our inline constraint for sort uh, this way and make it a defined type that we call lesser. Note that the type parameter name t and lesser can be called anything, it's just a name. We don't have any requirements on t, so we could just use the empty, the empty interface as a constraint. But because having no requirements is a common case, there's a new predeclared identifier called any. It simply stands for the empty interface. In the current design, any may only be used in constrained position, but it would be very natural to make it available in general at some point. But that would be a decision that we would probably take independent of the decision whether we, whether we would adopt generics or not. Also, like for functions, the scope of type parameters extends from the opening square bracket to the end of the type. And that's, of course, the whole type, uh, the whole point of type parameters, uh, because we want to be able to parameterize the type anywhere in its specification. So given this lesser interface, our sort can now be decomposed and written with an explicitly named lesser constraint. To make this work, the generic lesser type must be instantiated with a type. In this case, the type parameter alum. After all, we want the less method to take an alum as its argument. That's an important point. In general, we can't do anything with generic objects without instantiating them. Every generic function and type must be instantiated before it can be used. And this is true even if the, if the instantiation happens with another type parameter as opposed to a concrete type, as in the previous example. So let's switch perspective now and look at the internals of sort. Somewhere inside the sort function body, as a single step of the sorting algorithm, two list elements i and j are compared with less. Sort is likely in a library package and written without knowing uh, its callers or their concrete argument types. In generic Go, we want to be able to type check this function independently. This is the second reason why a type parameter needs a constraint. The constraint describes the operations, or in this case, the methods that an implementation can assume for, the, for any valid type argument. And in this case, we know that list of i and list of j are both of type alum, and thus we know that we can invoke less on list of i and pass it a list of j as an argument. And the compiler can type check this um, method invocation and pass the entire function. There are two important points here. First, the type alum is an abstract but otherwise genuine real type. Second, alum is not an interface type even though the constraint is an interface. All we know is that alum is a type and that it has a less method. So keeping these two last points in mind goes a long way to avoid confusion. A type parameter is a real type just like a channel or a map type is a real type, and it is not an interface type. The reason constraints are expressed as interfaces is because what we want to express are method sets, and an interface is exactly that, a method set. So with all this, have we reached our goal of a truly simple 
simply to use use function, sort, sort function? Not quite, because we still have to provide an explicit, explicit additional argument, the type argument book. Yet we know that the bookshelf is full of books, so it would be nice if we didn't have to specify that extra argument. This would remove clutter and repetition from the code. We can do this through argument type inference. The mechanism is straightforward. For each ordinary argument that is passed to a generic parameter, we try to deduce the respective type argument. There are some extra rules for untyped constants, which I won't go into in this, um, uh, in this talk, but the general mechanism is about the same. In our case, we have a bookshelf as ordinary argument. We compare this argument with the corresponding parameter type, which is slice of L. This parameter type is generic because it uses the type parameter L. We now try to match up corresponding parts of the respective type structures. This process is called type unification. Since bookshelf is a defined type and slice of alum is not, unification would fail right away. So we use the underlying type of bookshelf instead. Now we have two types, slice of book and slice of alum, that match in structure. Furthermore, book matches with alum and thus we can infer that alum should indeed be book. Thus type argument inference has successfully deduced in this case that the type argument for alum should be book. In general, Type, type unification is done with all and across all ordinary arguments and respective generic parameters. Type inference fails if any of the unification steps fails. Also, type inference can only infer types for type arguments that appear in, the, in parameter lists for incoming parameters or um, yeah, for incoming parameters. If the Type parameter only appears, for instance, in the result or inside the function body, it won't work because there's nothing that we can match that type parameter against. And with this, we can now refine the steps of a generic function call. If no explicit type arguments are provided, argument type inference is used to infer the type arguments if possible. The call is invalid if it's not possible or if inference fails for some reason. Given the type arguments, we can now type check the function instantiation as described before. And this may fail too, and then the call is again invalid. Successful instantiation results in a instantiated non-generic function, and now we can type check that function call as we would do in ordinary code. Argument type inference is really an optional feature, but with it, we believe that most generic function calls will look like ordinary, regular function calls. And we feel that this would be a great step towards keeping client code, that is, callers of generic functions, clutter-free and easy to use. Unfortunately, our scheme breaks down when we can't easily provide the required methods for a type argument. For instance, if we call sort with a slice of ints, it will fail because the element type will be int, which doesn't have a less method. <clears throat> so a type argument inference, um, argument type in, argument type inference, excuse me, would not be able to, you know, it would be able to deduce int, but it would not be able to then it would not be able to instantiate that function. We could define our own my int type, but that is pretty cumbersome. Also, it wouldn't easily work if we get an int slice from somewhere else and we are not in control of that element type. In the worst case, we would have to copy that slice before we pass it and that would be um, really cumbersome. So in a draft design, we address this problem by allowing interfaces to enumerate the list of types. And this is a pretty novel idea. An interface may now explicitly specify a list of types. Such a type list both defines what types are required to satisfy that interface and which operations are permitted on values of type parameters with such constraints. So here's an example. Um, here, the float interface is only satisfied by argument types whose underlying types are float32 or float64. With this, we can now write a generic sign function that operates on all floating point types. <clears throat> 
Interfaces with type lists can only be used as constraints. Here are the rules for satisfying a constraint with a type list. As one would expect, any argument type must implement the constraints methods. Additionally, the argument type or its underlying type must be found in the type list. We do include the underlying types because that makes generic functions more general. For instance, with this rule, our assign function will not only work for float32 and float64, but it will also uh, work for arguments of derived types such as my int, sorry, my float32 and my float64. And so with type lists, we can now write generic functions that rely on the ability to use operators, not just methods. For instance, here is a generic min function that's defined using a constraint called ordered that includes all the pre-declared types that can be ordered, that is, types that support a less than operator. So the ordered constraint will probably be used fairly frequently, and so in a real implementation, we anticipate finding this as a exported interface in some constraints package, for instance. Now, inside our min function, we compare the parameters x and y. Both of them are of type t. We don't know what type that is, but again, remember, it is a real type. We also know that this type, that this is a, that its actual type must be in the ordered type list. So because each of these types in that type list support a less than constraint, we are now uh, certain that no matter how we instantiate this min function, the less, of, the less than operation will be supported by whatever type argument we are providing. Here is a variation that is invalid. As I've mentioned before, the type parameters are real types, and different type parameters are in fact different types, even if they are constrained by the same constraint. And if that seems unintuitive, consider an ordinary parameter list. Given two parameters x and y of the same type, let's say int, we certainly would assume that x and y are different variables. Now, in this example, we compare x and y, which have the types tx and ty, both of them constrained by the ordered constraint. And as before, values of type tx and ty both support the less than operator. But the less than operator requires that both operands have the same type, and here they have not. So this code is actually invalid. Note that this code even remains invalid if we instantiate the function min with two identical, I'm um, sorry, invalid, if we instantiate this function invalid with two identical types. Because to type check the function body, the compiler only considers the function itself not the instantiations, because in general, it cannot know where the function is coming from, that the instantiation is coming from. Here is another more interesting example of type list use. With a constraint that accepts both slices and strings, we can combine separate functions operating on either byte slices or strings into a single generic function that accepts either type. Because both byte Slice of byte and string in the bytes constraint support indexing, and because both, uh, in both cases, indexing returns a byte element, and also the built-in function len is supported, the index function has all the machinery and operations it needs so it can be implemented. And here is a final example to give you an idea of the power of type parameters and type lists. Sometimes we want to express a relationship between two different type parameters. In this example, we want to express that one type parameter is a pointer type of the other one. And we can do this with a constraint that refers to another type parameter in the type list. Such a pair of type parameters is only satisfied when the concrete type arguments provided satisfy this relationship. Otherwise, instantiation will fail. So in a situation like this, the compiler can actually infer one type parameter from the other by analyzing the constraints. This seems fairly obvious. Here we know that one type parameter must be a pointer of the other one. So if we have the first one, then we can probably do the second one. We call this mechanism constraint type inference. It allows the function foo to be called without the need to provide any type argument 
In this case, the first type argument T is inferred from the first concrete ordinary argument via argument type inference. And then the second type PT is inferred from the, um, from the first one via constraint type inference. I'm not going to elaborate a little more on this. Uh, there are some detailed descriptions in the design draft. Again, this is an optional feature, but we believe it helps keeping more complex situations easy to use. So going back to our initial question, um, with constraints that allow us to express method and type requirements, we can now mostly write what we wanted to do in the first place. We can define a generic basic sort function that operates on a list of ordered basic types, and we can define a general sort function for arbitrary types which have a list method. We could even implement basic sort in terms of the general sort, so that would be perhaps not the most efficient approach. So with that, we can now summarize the mechanisms by which one would write generic code in Go. There's a new parameter list for type parameters. Functions and types may have type parameters. That's how they become generic. Type parameters have a type, which we call their constraint, and the constraint is simply an interface. When we use a generic function or type, we always must, always must instantiate them. That means provide concrete type arguments. And for functions, this may happen implicitly through type inference. And finally, type arguments must implement their constraint uh, interface for the instantiation to be valid. So it's actually surprisingly little, which is great. Little machinery, I mean. So if these generic features become part of Go, they will be the single biggest change to the language since, in, since its inception. So we better be really happy with it. So let's have a look. Type parameters are an old and well understood concept, and they also work well for Go. I don't think we have any issues here. Interfaces as a constraint are also a fairly well understood concept, and Phil Waters' research actually provides us with the confidence that uh, this mechanism is sound. So a smiley face here as well. Type lists and inter interfaces allow us to deal with the irregular built-in types and operators of Go. This is a novel idea. It's a bit untested. There is no other language that does anything similar, as far as we know. They're also a tiny bit odd. So not quite a smiley face here. And the syntax is, of course, the most hotly dis debated aspect of it all. But I think we have found a really clean and simple solution that, that works well and fits well with Go. So another smiley face here. And then type inference, though I haven't talked much about it, I feel we, it generally appears to do what, what we want it to do. I'd give this another thumbs up. And finally, and most importantly, how does it all fit with the rest of Go? So the good news is the current design is completely backward compatible. There's no new keywords, no existing code needs to change, and so forth. Type parameter lists are orthogonal to what we already, already have, which is great. And may, making it all fit nicely to get to fit making it all fit nicely together with existing Go was certainly a reason why it took so long to get here. I think we reached that goal. So in summary, I believe we have come to a fairly nice um, design at this point. If there's anything that could use some more fine tuning, it's perhaps around type lists and interfaces. So I'd like to end with some thoughts on the use of generics. Type parameters will be a new tool in the tool set of Go. Because they are orthogonal to the rest of the language, they literally open up a new dimension of coding styles. If you've been with Go from the very beginning, you may remember that initially we all got a little bit carried away with channels and go routines. Everything had to be written using channels and go routines. It took a while before we learned when it was appropriate to use them and when not. And I have no doubt that exactly the same thing will happen with generics. Once available, it will feel like everything needs to be written in a generic way. But genericity really introduces an extra level of abstraction, and needless abstraction 
introduces complexity. Really, we really need to maintain a healthy allergy towards complexity. We need to move cautiously. Here is an example of where a generic version is trivially possible but questionable. The IO util read all function operates on a single IO reader. One could specialize this function for each possible concrete argument by making it generic. And with argument type inference, the sites wouldn't, the call sites wouldn't even have to change. Because a read operation is likely going to dominate the cost of an indirect read method call, elimina eliminating the IO reader interface is unlikely to uh, have any impact on performance. And the, the result of the read all, and for that matter, the IO reader read method is fixed in type and independent of the actual reader type. So there's not going to be extra type safety gain either. And finally, making this code generic is unlikely to reduce memory consumption. So it seems this is a case where the generic approach is not justified. It simply does not solve an actual real problem. For contrast, here are two generic functions uh, implementing simple algorithms on channels, which cannot be written in a convenient way or in an efficient way in current goal. Argument type inference will make drain and merge calls even look like ordinary function calls. So these two cases seem like pretty good examples for the use of generic, generics. And actually, uh, generics should be great for a whole range of concurrency algorithms that we currently cannot easily write. So more generally, a lot of code that currently uses interfaces could possibly be changed and use type parameters. And I'm sure lots of people will be tempted to do exactly that. Now, again, this is not always justified. I've tried to come up with some simple criteria to consider. So a generic code, the generic code version, should lead to improved static type safety, uh, be more efficient in memory use, or provide significantly better performance compared to the alternative. So the read-all example we've seen before certainly doesn't satisfy any of these criteria, while the general algorithms do. So as with any programming tool, use generics only if it solves a real problem. So when it comes down to it, generics are really essentially glorified type-checked macros. And sometimes a macro is exactly what it takes, but often it is not. Think twice before using one. So where do we go from here? The Go team is actively working on a concrete implementation so we can iron out any open problems. We do have a pro prototype that translates generic Go to regular Go, and many people have played with it and sent us feedback and issues and so forth. But a, this prototype is not quite the same thing as having a real native implementation. So please continue to send us feedback. We really want to know if you can write the code you expect to write with generics, or whether you run into any serious problems with the current design. Our work on a concrete implementation should help us iron out any open problems that we do not fully understand at this point. Hopefully, we soon can make a fully informed decision whether to move forward with generics for real. Thank you very much.